horizon, weather-wise. Uh, Edelman PR has its very well-known trust barometer, and it's someone who, as I just said, is really immersed in all sorts of social networks. Um, I thought it'd be a good idea to examine some of the social media pressure points, look at the trends, and uh, try to put things into maybe a bigger communications context. So, so who am I? Well, you heard from James that I'm a PR guy turned social media strategist. I have my own consultancy, Mark Waxman Communications. I also work with Thornley Falls, a PR and digital communications firm. Um, I also teach social media at McMaster University in their uh, marketing and PR program. Uh, I blog, I'm the host of Inside PR, but I'm really the former lots of things. So I'm a former journalist, I'm a former published author, I'm a former TV writer. Believe it or not, I'm a former comedian, but no promises on that. So when I saw Yuck Yucks next door, I really did feel right at home. I'm a former drapery salesman, and I can still do a good drapery estimate and tell you where they get these and whether they should uh, replace them or not. When I started, though, in the PR industry, I was known as Martin Waxman Publicist. And I like that. It's all about the clips. Then I became Martin Waxman PR Professional, and now I'm just at Martin Waxman. Because I think, like many of you, I live a good deal of my life in the public. And what that means is that our personal and professional worlds are colliding all the time. If you remember that old Seinfeld episode with George Costanza, he couldn't stand when his personal life, his engagement to Susan collided with his friendship with Jerry and Elaine and, and the group. Um, closer. Oh, okay, like a rock musician. <laughs> So that took a bit of getting used to living in the public because really I feel I'm an introvert. Um, I recently wrote a post, actually last summer, about how we approach social media. And I thought we could divide it into four categories. First one is, are you a graceful diver? Do you just dive in? Are you kind of a messy jumper? You jump in, try things, but you're not really aware of the consequences. Are you a self-important uh, splasher, someone who just splashes around and could care less about the people next to them? Or do you wade in slowly? And I realized I'm a wader. Um, so I put a toe in, run out again, I try it again. I was on Twitter for about a year and a half before I posted anything. And I felt really guilty about that. I, re I really did. And I realized I have lurker tendencies. It's not a great thing. Uh, but I hate that term because of the connotations. Now, about a third of people on social networks are quiet. They are just listening. They are just watching. And we tend to pay attention to the people who are vocal, who tweet a lot or interact a lot. But as marketers, as communicators, as people who want to build relationships, we can't forget all the other people who are online and maybe not as loud as us because it doesn't mean they're not listening, they are. And it doesn't mean they're not watching, it doesn't mean they're not discovering, it doesn't mean they're not searching for things. And search, as you know, is the number one thing that we do online. In the olden days, I used to call search the yellow pages. And it's really true because how did you find out about businesses? You had the yellow pages. There were other things that were great about the yellow pages too because if you're really little, you could put it under a seat prop a kid up at the table. You can't do that now. Oh, still? Like this, okay. Um, things move a little bit more quickly now. So today, Google has the number one and the number two search engines. YouTube is the number two search engine. And 72 hours of video is uploaded every minute. That's three days of video uploaded every single minute. How many of you in this room believe that Google is democratic? Anybody? Well, that's good. That's good because I actually asked this to one of my classrooms and about uh, two-thirds of the class put their hands up. I want to believe Google is democratic. I really do. But they've done a lot of things to show that they're the ones who are shaping the way we search for things. Earlier this year, Google introduced Search Plus Your World. Anybody, has everyone heard about Search Plus Your World? What that does is if you're signed in, it customizes the search results based on what you like, what your friends like, what you clicked on. February 12th is the date of, uh, the birth date of two very famous people. Anyone know who they are? 
February 12th? Charles Darwin and Abraham Lincoln. So they were both born on February 12th, 1809. So this year, on February 12th, I wasn't surprised to see a Google Doodle because, you know, they often do that to commemorate uh, various events or celebrations. What did surprise me were the cupcakes and streamers and that it said, Happy Birthday, Mark. Have any of you experienced that on your birthday, the customization? And I thought, wow, Google knows me. <laughs> Damn right they know you because you've given them a lot of data. And they know your browsing habits, they know what you click on. Facebook knows you too, but Facebook approaches this differently. Facebook taps you on the shoulder and says, hey idiot, it's your friend's birthday. Don't forget, send a greeting. Google comes down from on high and acknowledges you and actually goes as far as customizing something. Very, very different way of uh, looking at things. So, you, you know, we don't think they're dem democratic, but I think the most we can hope for from Google is that they become a benevolent dictator. But search plus your world is only the beginning for them. We're moving towards what Google calls the semantic web. Any engineers in here? Okay. Has anyone heard about the semantic web? Know what it is? Yeah. What? Go ahead. That's right. It searches the relationship between words. It understands relationships. So before, if you search for me, if you searched for Martin Waxman, it would look at it as two elements and look for the times where those two elements appeared together. <coughs> Martin plus Waxman. Now, with semantic search, Google is starting to recognize those two words as an entity, as a person, and it shapes the results that we're getting. David Weinberger, who is the author of the Clue Train Manifesto, a great book, and a new book called Too Big to Know, disagrees with this approach to the semantic web. He talks about network knowledge, and that is big, messy, entropic data, information all over the place, with no beginning, no end, very different to what we uh, now refer to as knowledge, which is book-based knowledge, beginning, middle, and end, self-contained in that technology that we call a book. He thinks a link-based approach is better than a semantic approach because it offers a much more predictable way, for a predictable format that all machines can recognize. So for example, if there was a post written about me in Chinese, in Mandarin, whatever, um, and it mentioned my name, that wouldn't necessarily come up in a semantic search. But if they linked to me, that would come up in link-based knowledge. So you see the difference between semantic and link-based knowledge? Um, there's good and bad things about that. The good thing is the results are more relevant, they're a bit more social, we're getting results from friends, friends and people we trust, that's good. But it's bad because we're also getting the results we expect to see. And so it reinforces those echo chambers. If you're left-leaning politically, you'll see left-leaning results. If you're right-leaning politically, you'll see more right-leaning results. And what happens is we lose that serendipity, that same kind of feeling we used to have if you went into a bookstore or a library and you browse around and you come across something that you hadn't discovered before. And so that's something that uh, we may be losing that messiness, that entropic version of knowledge. So content may be king, but I think Google is becoming the great curator. We need to think about the effect that that has on the content we produce um, and how customization and relationships are becoming more and more important than ever. Now, speaking of relationships, does anyone know what this term means? Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Anybody study first year biology? Okay. So what that is, is that is the recapitulation theory. And you learn that in first year biology, and it's a theory that says you need to replicate all the steps in evolution to get from one stage to another. So we all started out as single cells and evolved through our growth to where we are today, which means that the guy on the left evolves into the guy on the right. Kind of a scary thought. There used to be a saying, which was never trust anyone over 30. First wave of hippies reached 30, and they kind of upped it to 40, and then it went up from there. Well, I think the generation gap is back again. But it's not 30, it's 35. 
there seems to be a digital divide between those people who live and understand social media, and I'm making a big generalization here because there's a lot of people over 35 who work in it and understand it, so bear with me here. But I think there's a different approach between boomers and Gen Xers and millennials. Millennials have a whole new way of approaching the world. How many people in here are millennials? One? When you're in charge, please be kind to me. Um, there was some interesting research from uh, Rogers, which is a client of mine. And they came out with what they call the Rogers Innovation Report. They did a study on our connected personal lives, how we use email, how we use smartphones, how we use landlines, do we make arrangements to meet people via text, do we call them, do we knock on the door, um, how do we go out? And what stood out across the board on all the results is that if you're over 35, you do things one way. If you're under 35, you do things another. Most people here aren't millennials. How many people have landlines in here? Yeah, a good portion of the room. Again, if you're under 35, you don't have a landline. Because why? Why do you need it? And I question the fact, you know, my wife and I have a landline. We've had that number for 25 years. And we don't want to keep up the number, but nobody calls. They call me on my cell. They call my wife on her cell. They call our kids on their cells. So it doesn't ring, and we're paying all this money for it. Um, the Canadian Council of PR Firms did a similar study on uh, the media we trust, and it corroborated those over and under 35 results. Over 35, trust mainstream media, under 35, social media. Reuters Institute has a digital report. Uh, they found that 40% of people under 25 get their news via social media. And I see that with my son, who uh, recently graduated from university. He's media agnostic. He might be on the Globe and Mail site, but if I asked him about it, he said, yeah, I just happen to be there. He doesn't care that it's the Globe Mail necessarily. He cares that it has the information that he wants to find out, something interesting to him. Instagram, how many of you use Instagram? Photo sharing platform, 27% of the users, so the biggest number of users are under 29. So it's a fundamental shift in the way that we get our information and news, and with, in the way that we uh, learn and interact with each other. And it's really, it's social and it's generational. And it's not necessarily the Globe Mail or the record and the CBC versus the new order of media, although it could become that. But it's a world of abundant content, custom curation that's filtered through our connections, all the people we know and trust. So where are we going with all of this? Well, Clay Shirky, who is a professor of digital and interactive technology at New York University, and the author of Here Comes Everybody, a great book if you haven't read it on uh, how the changes um, are affecting us, says that we can only predict things based on what we know. So because we're going through so many changes right now, we don't know what the future is necessarily going to be. So maybe the hippies were right saying down with the establishment, maybe we have to have a whole new communications establishment come up. Maybe the people in charge need to let go and look at things from a millennial's point of view. I think we probably need to do that sooner than later. And right now, to the one millennial in here, usually there are more, I do want to apologize for my generation. I think um, one of the reasons we behave the way we were is because we, we ate all this fast food. And we consumed a ton of fast food. I think you could say my first experience with mobile is a drive-in restaurant. Um, you used to drive up to drive-in restaurants, probably a lot of you remember those. Um, and you shout your order in, it's delivered to you, you consume it in your car on the go. I, I think that was mobile consumption at its finest for my generation, as long as we didn't spill. Spill that was here, good trouble. So we've heard that mobile is around the corner for the last few years. I think we've turned the corner and it's here. Let's look at a few facts. Instagram, as I mentioned, an entirely mobile app was sold to Facebook for a lot. Remember, Andy? One billion dollars. I wish I could do Dr. Eagle. One billion dollars. One billion dollars for a mobile only platform. According to Nielsen, who does the research, two thirds of the phones being bought now are smartphones. That's a lot. And almost 70% of the time that we're using those smartphones, we're not making phone calls. We're doing other things on there. Gartner Research tells us that by the end of 2013, more people are going to be going online via their smartphone and tablet than via computer. Big shift. Um, and in the US, this actually bothers me. In the US right now, 
people are spending more time on their mobile devices than they do with print media. So what's that say about literacy? There's also a dark side to mobile. An article, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times not long ago, talks about how we should be calling them tracking devices. Because really, that's what they do. Every single app we upload, we give it permission to know where we are. It knows exactly where we are, what we're doing. If you check into Foursquare, you're providing them with an anthropological map of your every footstep. Do you want to do that? Those are all questions we need to ask ourselves. Um, we're more connected than ever, and uh, we continue to be. And I think the good part of that is it gives us all more flexibility in our workplace. So the enterprise tablet, once tablets get that enterprise version and they're close, I think that's going to really have an impact on the way we work and on the distributed workforce, on the fact that we really can work from anywhere and collaborate with people all over the world. Um, it's certainly revitalizing the magazine industry, anyone who has a tablet, and uh, downloads magazines. Magazines are starting to really adapt well to the tablet format, and newspapers aren't far behind. Not the free editions, but the ones that you have to pay for. So tablets are a big thing that's changing the way we interact with people. I think retail has an incredible amount of potential if they can learn to harness uh, location. How many of you here are on Foursquare? So if you Foursquare location-based app where you check in, you can become mayor. I am the mayor of so many places, and you know what? They don't have a clue. I'm the mayor of all these greasy spoons in Toronto because I like eating bacon and eggs for breakfast. Uh, and I go in there, and they don't, they don't care. They don't know. They don't, but there's a, a really great opportunity for them to interact with people. Foursquare, just a few months ago, made a change that lets businesses now communicate with people who check in before they couldn't talk to them, and also communicate with people who, who like them. So that's a way to interact, to provide specials, to engage people. Um, augmented reality, when you're walking by a store, you can see what's for sale, you can do comparison shopping. All the things that turn customers into a community of ambassadors. And, and the tools are there, but retail really needs to uh, embrace it. David Armano, who is a social media strategist at Edelman, wrote a blog post for the Harvard Business Review where he says we should stop calling it mobile because mobile is much too synonymous with uh, smartphones and apps. He said we should start calling it mobility because really it is connectivity on the go, wherever we are. Could be that window. Maybe there's something we interact with on that window or in a store window or on the bus. There's all sorts of different ways that we can interact. <laughs> We're connected wherever we are. And it, it, it gives us a fresh perspective. So we may be untethered to our desks, but we're probably more tethered to the cloud, and our, our personal and professional lives, I think, are getting more and more and more intertwined, and it's something that we all have to deal with. On Facebook, you know, I have cousins who bug me, I have friends, uh, current friends, old friends, I have colleagues, I have people I hired, I have people I fired. How do you react on a platform like that with that diverse group of people? I know you can segment them into lists, but you need to be aware of what you're doing and what you're saying and how much public, uh, how much, how public you want to make your life. So we're so busy that none of us really have the time anymore to sit in a theater and watch a play or a movie. Um, I think media is changing. I think we all know that. In the old days, the big three media companies were NBC, CBS, and ABC, if you were in the States. Um, and to do well, someone said, on TV in those days, you only had to be better than two other people. It's true, because there were only three channels to compete with. Now, everything's turned on its face. Now we have the big three, Facebook, YouTube, and uh, Google and Twitter, those are the new big three. LinkedIn is acting a bit like the Wall Street Journal, business warehouse, and Pinterest is becoming the first specialty network, really organized around specialties. Um, media is now made up of amateurs and professionals, but we're all competing for the same thing, audience. Um, before they did their IPO, and I don't want to talk about Facebook's IPO because that's a whole other story, but Facebook reported that 85%, so the vast majority of the revenue comes from Advertising. That sounds like a media company uh, to me. 
And they're changing their ad platforms every week. The most recent change they announced is they're testing this with big companies. They're allowed to bring their data in. So bring their customer data. Facebook will match that up to user data. So companies will be able to target their customers who may not have liked them with ads. How do you feel about that? Um, YouTube is working both ends of the pro amateur production spectrum. So you know they have uh, all the big money, 100 million bucks that they paid to A-listers like Madonna and Ashton Kutcher and, and Jay-Z to develop original talent. On the other side, they have something called Next Up. It's for amateurs. It's for like guys like this uh, person named Brian O'Dell, lives in Nebraska in his parents' basement, and he goes around the Midwest and he interviews uh, metal bands, and he posts videos, and he's got a big audience. And they flew him and about 50 other people to New York, gave them 35,000 bucks, which is a lot of money if you're uh, living in your parents' basement. It's not 100 million, but it's still good money. They showed them how to optimize their videos, and they're sharing it 50-50 with the audience. Really interesting how they're working both sides of the spectrum. Twitter is becoming a news feed. Now, I don't know if you noticed, Twitter actually announced a big change yesterday. You can now upload a landscape-style header profile the way you can with Facebook on uh, your timeline, your cover photo, as they call it. So you can now have a more descriptive photo there. But Twitter is becoming a news feed, and news organizations are able to buy promoted posts. NASCAR recently bought the hashtag for NASCAR, and Twitter worked with them to design it as a way of aggregating all the news. Matthew Ingram, who writes for Gigom, used to be at the Globe and Mail, he wrote a story about the shootings in Scarborough last summer, showing how the, there was a more authentic news story on Twitter with all the crowdsourced information than there is on CBC. And he says social media like Twitter are becoming the newsroom, new newsrooms. Twitter also recently hired a journalist in chief from the Washington Post. LinkedIn hired an editor from Fortune. So you can see they're becoming media companies. They figured out their business model. It's coming from advertising, but they're not paying a cent for content. That's very, very different than traditional media. And how does traditional media compete with that when you're not paying a cent for content? Um, we are now the new programmers. We're the audience, yes. We're also critics, we're creators, and we're all rolled up. All those things are rolled up into one. We're the keepers of the second screens. So we're not only watching television or consuming entertainment, we are interacting with it. And what about the ads? I think the ads are probably as important for new media companies to survive as for traditional media companies because businesses have to have revenue in order to survive. We all know that. Um, and I think if you look at that 30-second TV model, that hasn't changed since the beginning of the TV. When the 30-second ad came out, we were watching TV, there were very few channels, and you had to actually stand up, walk to the TV to change the channel if you didn't want to watch the ad. Well, ads didn't evolve as we started getting clickers, as we started getting PBRs, as things changed. I think there's an opportunity for advertising to do something with that time, connect what's happening online, maybe do some real time activities in those breaks, uh, in the middle of shows. There's lots of things they can do, but they have to get beyond the model. And then things like Pinterest, which are based on people's interests, there's a great opportunity there for businesses to create some kind of new form of advertising. Mashable is doing a terrific job of it. Nordstrom's, the high-end department store in the US, they're doing a great job on Pinterest, showcasing um, their aspirational fashions and getting people to share and talk about them, and hopefully that's driving business. So, new media get it. Traditional media are starting to understand. Um, we have to adopt a digital first approach. Matt Hartley, who many of you read, uh, heads the technology for the Financial Post. And he said their paper is taking a digital first approach. They break news on Twitter, the story develops on their blogs, and then analysis happens online and finally in print. So print no longer delivers the news. Very, very different approach for newspapers. John Payton, who is a 36-year newspaper veteran, former head of Sun Media, now the head of a company called Digital First Media, gave a speech to the Canadian Journalism Foundation. He said the industry has to go digital first, and newspapers have to stop listening to journalists. 
and start listening to their digital folks and build a community hub because that's the only way they're going to evolve. Well, PR and communications uh, really are the flip side of media. Some people call it the B side. Um, so if our colleagues in the digital and media, or in the media world are going digital first, if we don't adapt or evolve, we're going to be in a PR uh, or publicity rut. And that will relegate us to the sidelines of the marketing or communications world. So I think agencies, if you work in an agency or if you work in an organization, you need to think from a digital first approach. And that's something we do at Thornley Fallis, um, and I've worked at a lot of agencies. We're organized around six key areas. So we're organized around strategy because it all starts with strategy. Social, content marketing, PR, uh, video, and design. And I know I'm preaching to the converted here, but you know, in order to do that well, you can't sit on the sidelines. You've got to participate, you've got to put on your social lab coats, you've got to be curious, always curious, you've got to test and refine because new things are happening all the time. But they're new tools. So just because the tools are changing doesn't mean the principles don't apply. But it's no longer that book of clippings. It's really the first few pages of results if you're a communicator on Google because that's how we find information. So how do we affect that? for our clients or our organizations. How do we form very public uh, relationships with our customers or with influencers online? How do we look at engagement versus impressions? How do we look at uh, being transparent? I think, I'm sorry. There's a very small lip here. It's really all about creativity. And I think we're all in showbiz, at least a little. We need to think that we're all in showbiz. So what do we need to do? Well, as I said, it all starts with um, the strategy. And strategy begins by listening. You have to listen to what people are saying. You have to do your research. And now we can listen to conversations and understand what's being said. And then you need to provide training. So there's an opportunity for all of you to be able to train people into how to effectively use these tools and to know that not every tool works in every instance. We need to think about the content we produce. Google loves fresh content. When they change their algorithm, you know, it's done. So that if you provide fresh, meaningful content, you'll show up in search. So you've got to write in plain English. You've got to write stories that really resonate with the people you're trying to reach. You need to be creative. You need to tell stories visually. So as communicators, we used to be great at telling stories in words. Now we need to tell them in pictures, too. So how do you do that? You need to learn how to use photos, video, and uh, combine them in a new way. Um, there's so much information out there. There's an opportunity for us to become those trusted sources, to become the content curators. There's an opportunity for us to find the audience and connect with them. That's build relationships. Those take time. And then hopefully join with them, engage with them, and create a community by going to where they are. And finally, it's all about commerce. Because if you're a business, you have to figure out what works so you make money and you can survive. It's a really exciting time out there, I think, but it demands a shift in the way we uh, approach the world. It's hard for profitable businesses to grasp because it's really hard to want to change uh, something that's worked for so many years. But what is working now, I think, is going to work, uh, is working less well than it was, and it will continue to diminish unless we uh, adapt and uh, something that will replace it, something very social. And hopefully, we can uh, step up to that. Thank you. So I think we have time for a few questions. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. You know, large company that you think is doing social media really well, but you can sort of go scope out the tree to follow and learn from. Sorry, can you say that again? I couldn't. Is there a large Canadian company that you think is doing social media very well? Um, Canadian company or, or other company? You know what, I think some of the media companies are starting to really do it well. Um, I mentioned Mashable. I think Mashable's a great example of an organization that does really, really well and some marketing companies. So if you go on Mashable and you look at what they do, they have their website, they have their email blasts you can customize, 
They promote on Twitter, they're on Facebook all the time, they uh, engage with people on Pinterest. I think they're a, a great company that does it. For Canadian companies that do well on social media, you know what, I think Tim Hortons does a really good job. I think Tim Hortons does an amazing job on Facebook because you see people really interact with Tim Hortons because we like Tim Hortons, right? It's kind of part of our ethos, part of our culture. We like them. We go onto their Facebook page and you see so many likes and comments. People are interacting with them. Um, so I think those are two that you could look at. Anyone else? Yeah. Talking about Facebook, saying that uh, you know, the IPO is kind of gone a bit wrong, um, but what do you make of Bernard Zuckerberg's um, speech at TechCrunch Disrupt? Because he talked a lot about building things, but didn't, I think there's only one mention in the whole half hour of kind of delivering ROI for advertisers. If a business is built around advertising, what do you think is going to happen when you try to introduce, you know, effectively, you know, companies who are just talking to people based on you know, finding out what they're doing, they're, 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 they know that they're customers, but effectively Facebook's moving the ability to see what's going on within their network and advertise to 